With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Good afternoon, everybody. It is great to be with you on yet another afternoon on this Tuesday. There is quite a bit to get to, so we're going to jump right into it. Thank you to everybody that is joining us right now on Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, uh, Periscope, wherever you may be watching us. And by the way, I still never figured out exactly what happened with YouTube. All I know is that now, apparently, we're on again. So I don't know what the problem was, but apparently it's been resolved. So thank you for everybody that's been watching us on YouTube, and we appreciate you dropping by to see us today. So lots to, that has been going on here in the house, and, and it really does seem like, and I think this is an indication of this, so I'm just going to go very broad, and then I'm going to get very specific with the state of Alabama. I don't know exactly why this is. Maybe it was just the the right string of events coming together. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the Democrat Party has gone so far in the opposite direction on this issue. But it seems as though people are finally coming around on abortion. And it's been trending this way for a while. Ever since I believe it was 92 or 93, the trend has been going in the direction of more people are becoming pro-life. But it has really snowballed, and what's different is not so, many, so much that I, we're seeing big droves of people that are pro-choice suddenly becoming pro-life, but what we are seeing, what we are seeing is that people that are pro-life, who previously were silent or would talk about it but only if prodded or if they felt that they had to, now there is a real fire and enthusiasm for getting rid of the evil that is abortion. And I'm not sure exactly why. I think it's actually a number of factors, and I think a lot of it has to do with the Democrat Party deciding to go so incredibly radical on this. For example, one of the examples that I just gave, and there's a similar bill in Virginia that was proposed. In the state of New York, people were suddenly favoring, basically in infanticide afterward, but the bill itself allowed for abortions up to the point of birth. And that's something that only, I believe, if I'm remembering my poll data correctly, only 13% of Americans are on board with abortion up until birth. And so what you saw is even people that were pro-choice and considered themselves advocates for abortion remaining illegal didn't agree with that decision. And because of that, I do think that you're finally seeing the needle move a little bit on this issue that they're saying, okay, maybe I don't agree with the pro-life stance. Maybe I think there are some abortions that are okay, but I definitely don't agree with those guys that are saying five minutes before it's born, you ought to be able to, to go in and do an abortion. And so I do think that the, the Democrats showing and overplaying their hand has really caused a lot of movement on this particular issue. And that is somewhat indicative. And I know that we're in an uber, uber red state, but I think that the the fervor and the zeal and the fire that has really come about just here in the past few weeks when it comes to the issue of abortion has been spurring on a lot of action. We've already seen the state of Iowa and the state of Mississippi pass heartbeat bills. We've already seen our neighbors, Georgia and Tennessee, have those in the works in legislation. And now, not to be outdone by them, it seems that our own House of Representatives has floated a ban on abortion. Now, technically speaking, technically speaking, according to the law, this is not technically a full-on abortion ban. You remember that we actually talked about a bill, and this is a different version of that same bill that was written by the Alabama Pro-Life Coalition that Eric Johnston wrote. We talked about a bill that just full-on bans abortion. This one 
in a technical way doesn't, but effectively it does. And here's what I mean by that. So what would happen is this bill and the, the content of it, just looking at the raw wording, it would ban any abortions after two weeks. Now, the reason that would be so effective in limiting abortions greatly is that most women don't realize that they're pregnant. Like, they may be suspicious, but they can't actually prove that they're pregnant until about two weeks. So is it is it as good as a ban on abortion? No, not really. And one thing that I believe that would probably still allow for are chemically induced abortions. So things like the morning after pill, that sort of thing. And you do have to be careful about that because... There are some pills like that that destroy a already fertilized egg, and there are some that keep conception from happening. And so different pills do different things, and I'm not trying to, to lump all of them in. As long as it stops conception from happening, I don't have a problem with that kind of birth control. I very much have a problem with anything that destroys an embryo, something that has already been fertilized and has its own unique genetic signature. So there is a little bit of a difference there, but without getting off into the weeds, those are the types of abortion that this bill probably wouldn't be able to do much about. But the point is, after two weeks, I mean, that's going to knock out a lot. I mean, the vast, vast majority of abortions that are done in this state if this bill goes through. And so while it may not be exactly what we want, it's very close. And it will more or less end abortions in the state. And that's, the, that's, of course, the end goal. It's going to end a lot of them. And the net result is going to be less abortions. And so, you know, it is a win if this thing winds up actually going through and becoming law. Representative Terry Collins of Decatur is bringing the bill forward. I've actually reached out to her office. I'm hoping to expect back from her. Before too long, hopefully we'll be able to have her on the show for tomorrow. But Representative Terry Collins of Decatur is the one that's bringing this bill forward, and it currently has 63 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives, which is a very good sign. Why? Because there's only 105 representatives in the House, so if you've already got 63 co-sponsors, that basically means all you would need is the, well, it does mean that if just the co-sponsors vote yes, it passes. So very, very encouraging based on those numbers. If this thing winds up going to the floor, and I imagine it will, it's pretty much a guaranteed thing that's going to pass. Its own co-sponsors would have to vote against it for it not to pass. And Senator Albritton has already brought up or is planning to bring up a companion bill in the Senate. So we've already got the House pretty much locked down. And... It looks pretty good in the Senate. There's a good chance that the Senate winds up passing a companion bill that Senator Albritton would be drawing up. So what essentially this would do is it would also effectively end abortion clinics in Alabama. Now, it doesn't out and out say that, but like I said, pretty much the only abortions that would still be going on here in the state of Alabama would be chemically induced abortions. And while clinics like Planned Parenthood, not specifically just them, but clinics that offer abortions like Planned Parenthood offer those, it's probably not enough to sustain them, monetarily speaking. And so because of that, especially if you're cutting into a giant chunk of their business, I mean, to, to give an analogy here, it would be almost like saying to, I don't know, Burger King, okay, you can technically stay in business, but you can't make burgers, fries, Cokes, or any desserts. Like, so, so we're just going to sell chicken fries? Yeah, pretty much. So if that were to happen, it wouldn't technically, from a legal perspective, say, Burger King, you can't do business here anymore. But it would so limit what they can offer that it doesn't make sense for them to stay open. And it's, it's not a sustainable business model at that point. And so here's what, what is really going on here is that it would effectively get rid of the abortion clinics in the state of Alabama just because they wouldn't be able to survive very long having to limit such a small amount of services. So this bill does a lot of good. If it actually winds up passing, and I imagine it will, then 
th there's a lot of good that this bill could do. It'll probably get a court challenge pretty much immediately. I mean, that's sort of a foregone conclusion that it's going to be challenged in court almost the second that it passes, if it passes. And in fact, the ACLU has already vowed to get rid of it. They've already been talking about this bill. They've been talking about the bills in our neighboring states in Mississippi, Georgia, and Tennessee. So this thing's almost for sure going to get an immediate court challenge. And that may not necessarily be a bad thing because there is a chance that this would be the case that allows for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. Now, you may remember that Personhood Alabama right now is working on a case that they are hoping gets Roe v. Wade overturned, but they're coming at it from an incredibly different angle. They're trying to establish, as their name would imply, the personhood of the child inside the womb and make the argument that this is a person that deserves all the protections that any other child would have. And they're sort of doing it, oddly enough, through the uh, paternal case because their case rides on the father suing for the wrongful death of his son. So that's kind of where their case is. Presumably, and sometimes cases go a, a different direction, something that you really weren't expecting. But one thing that could happen here is that we see a case where it spurs from this bill, and from this case you can make more of a state's rights argument which I would really love to see because I think that it is a viable argument and I think that it is a correct argument if you're looking at the way the, the 10th Amendment reads and the breakdown of federal powers and enumerated powers, that kind of thing. So if this case winds up going to the court, yes, it would also be a case that is pitted against abortion and overturning Roe v. Wade, but you make a very different argument for these two cases. And having two different modes of attack is usually a good battle strategy. So with this, it would be, I imagine, more of a state's rights argument than a individual life and, and human rights argument that you would see on the other case. So there's a lot going on right now, and right now liberals, you'll, you'll see in the national media, I've read no telling how many articles about this, op-eds, talking about how abortion is under attack, and, and they're not wrong. It absolutely is under attack. And I am proud to be one of the soldiers in that battle, and I hope that you are too. There's some really great people that we're looking at here on the front lines trying to get this uh, abomination against all de human decency abolished. Now, if you had to ask what I think this is going to do if it does wind up making it to the Supreme Court, I, it's hard to say. But there's a chance that it could get overturned, and I'm not even talking about the justices contemplating whether Kavanaugh or Roberts would wind up siding with the liberals or any of that. Right now, just kind of looking at it without trying to factor that in, looking at the precedent of Roe v. Wade, it probably get, does get overturned because on a technicality, it's not breaking precedent because the standing rule of thumb has sort of been that what you need to do is you can limit abortion and you can restrict it. You just can't out and out outlaw it, which is the reason that they put the two-week stipulation in there instead of saying, nope, all, all abortion is illegal. That's the reason that they're doing it. That's the legal strategy that they're trying, that they're trying to effectively ban it without technically banning it completely because once they do that, they know there's absolutely no chance that this would stand up to the precedent of, of Roe v. Wade unless the judges specifically wanted to overturn it. So this is actually a pretty clever legal maneuver. And so what they're hoping is that the judges are going to say, well, technically they're not banning it outright, but I think what's more likely, unfortunately, is that in a federal court and, and probably at the Supreme Court level as well, the judges would take the opposite stance. And what I mean by that is they would look at it and say, okay, technically it's not a ban, but it's definitely a ban on any abortions in an effective way. So it may not be technically a ban, but it's pretty much a ban, and because of that, we're just going to, to get rid of it. That would be my prediction. I hope and pray that I am wrong, or I hope and pray that something else overturns Roe v. Wade, but as far as this goes, I think that that's probably the verdict that they would reach if you put it in front of the Supreme Court. But nonetheless, whether or not this gets overturned in court, this is the right thing to do. And if it gets overturned in court, you say, you know what, we tried, and we're going to keep trying. 
And that is the attitude that we need to take. I, I've been so tired of conservatives and people that claim to really care about the life of the children that are being lost because of abortion saying, well, there's nothing we can do. The courts have already ruled it's settled law. You know, you've heard the platitudes before. I don't have to repeat all of them. I'm so sick of that because they're essentially saying, well, I care about it, but not enough to actually do anything about it. And that's what is so disheartening to see people that talk about how they're pro-life and talk about how they think that abortion is wrong and ought to be overturned. And then when they actually take office, they don't do anything that reflects that belief. And so it is good to see that there is a, a groundswell, as it were, of support for getting rid of abortion. And it seems to me that we may be on the cusp of finally doing away with this. And, and I hope and pray that we are. And the Democrats, they fight tooth and nail, don't give any excuses, don't care if they're in the minority. They always fight for their agenda. With Republicans, that is not always the case. And so I, I get very sick of them giving excuses and saying, well, there was nothing we could do. Well, even if you put a bill up and it fails and fails miserably, at least you were trying. At least you were doing something. And that's the thing. Even if this thing winds up getting completely overturned, I'm not going to blame the people in office because they did do something. They did try. And if that happens, that's on the court. That's not on them. But if you choose to not do anything because you think that there's no chance that you can win, then you're basically guaranteeing that nothing is going to change. And that is, I think, why people get frustrated with politics in general and specifically on this. But Alabama is the birthplace of the civil rights movement. And I think it should also be the birthplace of the human rights movement. The right that every child in the womb is considered a human being from the point of conception. And I know that that movement has been going on for a very long time now, but the fact that Alabama may actually be the place that originates this fight, that crafts, as it were, the arrow that destroys this abomination that we have allowed to go on the, in this country for decades now, that is a reason to be proud of this state, and I pray that we are. I mean, I'm ready for to get rid of abortion. I don't care what state does it, but it just would be a nice thing if Alabama, which is the home of the civil rights movement, also enshrined the human rights into the unborn. I think that that would be, you know, a great feather in our cap. So I do think that there is a, a little bit of reflection going on there between the civil rights movement and the, the fight to end abortion. Speaking of that, as many of you know, if you were watching the show the other day, I actually did go and see the unplanned movie the other night. So the, the movie, for those of you who aren't aware, it's a movie about a former Planned Parenthood employee of the year and a clinic director who actually turned over a new leaf after seeing an abortion take place and completely changed her worldview, and now is a pro-life advocate. So this movie is her story, and it's not done in a documentary style. It's actually done in a narrative style. So you're, you're not going to... She does narrate a little bit, but it's not... You know what I'm saying. It's not a documentary style. It's like it's, it's done in such a way that it's more of a storytelling mode, which I think actually hits the nail on the head. So I was going to go ahead and, and just sort of give my thoughts on it. I may kind of accidentally slip and give away a couple of spoilers. So if you're going to see it anyway and you know that you are, you may want to avoid it, but I really don't think I'm going to be giving any spoilers or anything that's story significant that wouldn't have already been revealed in the trailer. So here we go. First of all, I think it's important to note, critics hated it. I mean, critics absolutely hated it. By, well, I say that, a lot of critics hated it. That would be the best way to say it. It wasn't horrible, but... Rotten Tomatoes, which has kind of become the, the gold standard because it's a conglomerate of a lot of different critics, Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 53% from the critics, and that is out of 100, so this is a failing grade. But if you're looking at the audience score, 92% of the audience, which I would be in this camp as well, loved this movie. And this is not an uncommon thing on Rotten Tomatoes where the audiences and the critics do not agree. 
I mean, it's not uncommon at all for critics to really love a movie and the audience hated or vice versa. And that is really on display here with the critics versus the audience for their review. But most of the reviews that I was looking at, and these are the professional critics, the people that actually do this for a living, just about all the reviews that I was looking at, their rationale for not liking the movie has nothing to do with the movie. And I'm not saying that it doesn't have anything to do with the content of the movie or the message of the movie. I'm just saying that it's not things like that you would typically think of as how to measure a movie. In other words, the storytelling, the acting, the cinematography, uh, cinematography, all of those things, most of their reasons, and there are a few exceptions, but most of their reasons seem to revolve around the fact that they don't like the politics in the movie. In other words, they're pro-abortion, the movie's anti-abortion, and, and therefore they don't like it. That seems to be the trend, and if you don't believe me, I'll just actually read some of the reviews right here. So this one is Roger Moore of Movie Nation. He says, let's just hope this latest pure flicks propaganda doesn't incite violence. This guy's really afraid that this movie is going to incite violence. I mean, it's just a blatantly obvious, stupid thing to say, especially considering that if you watch this movie, and again, this is a minor spoiler, but I don't think it's a huge deal. They actually do address that there were terrorists that attacked a abortion doctor and they talked about, they basically don't talk about it. They, they show instead of tell, which is a good rule of thumb in a movie anyway. But they, they sort of show how scared the actress is and, and how terrifying that is, which it is. I mean, nobody should have to live in fear of that. Of course, the, the violence is wrong. But even if you took that scene out, I don't think there's any chance that this movie incites violence. But they put a scene that actually specifically decries violence in the movie. So I don't really understand his criticism there. Uh, another one, abortion is a serious topic. This movie is ridiculous. That's Jordan Hoffman from The Guardian. That's not a critique of the movie. That's a critique of your political beliefs. You're saying, well, the movie's ridiculous. That's not criticism. I mean, it's not constructive criticism for sure. There's a difference in saying, okay, well, the, this aspect of the film could have been better, and they made a couple mistakes here, here, and here. There's a big difference in that and saying, ah, it sucks. That's not a critique. And so he's saying, basically, again, because I, because I like abortion and this movie is anti-abortion, I don't like the movie. Um, another one, Adam Graham, it's strictly to rally the base. In other words, he's saying the whole point of this movie is to rally the base and create a political movement. And so I don't like the movie. Well, first of all, if it does rally the base, who cares? That doesn't mean that the movie is bad or good that says nothing to the quality of the film itself. Maybe it rallies the base, maybe it doesn't, but that bears absolutely no weight whatsoever on whether or not the movie was enjoyable to watch or it was a good movie versus whether it was not a good movie. So again, not a criticism, just a guy that doesn't like the politics of it. And here's another one. This is Luke Thomas of Forbes. Perhaps the most bipartisan thing I can say that is if you like Trump rallies, especially one featuring Mike Pence, this is probably the movie for you. I don't say it as a compliment, but I suspect all involved may take it as one. So first of all, openly mocking Trump supporters in his, in his review here. So that's one thing. And another, whether or not somebody likes a Trump rally or not, which, by the way, I'm not a fan of the Trump rallies. I think I've been pretty clear on that, even though I really love this movie. But whether or not somebody's a fan of a Trump rally or not and would also like the movie, that still is not a criticism of the movie itself. And that's what it's so abundantly transparent. And like I said, there were some reviews that were a little bit more substantive and less subjective than these. But most of the negative reviews on here were just, well, I don't like the politics of the movie. And, and so because of that, I don't like the movie. That's generally what they all distill down into, and that explains why the critics really didn't like the movie and the audience really did. 92 is an absurdly high mark on the audience like or dislike scale. So by contrast, just to give you sort of an idea of how common this sort of thing is on Rotten Tomatoes, by contrast, Captain Marvel 
got a 78% from the critics and a 60% from the audience. So 78, and it actually used to be higher. I believe it was 85-ish when it started. And there have been some bad reviews that came out since then. But the critics thought that it was pretty good and it's certified fresh, which means it gets a passing grade on Rotten Tomatoes. But I mean, it's getting absolutely destroyed by the audiences. And I'll say this about Captain Marvel. This isn't a review of Captain Marvel, so I'll just give my, my real quick stance on it. It's a mid-tier Marvel movie. It's all right. It's about around the caliber of Iron Man 3 or, or Thor 2. That's about where it is. It's not horrible. If you're sitting alone on the couch and you've got nothing to do on a Saturday afternoon, yeah, watch Captain Marvel. But it's not groundbreaking cinema. And so this is an example of a bunch of very far left-leaning film people that are looking at a film that has some pretty overt social justice warrior overtones that I didn't think wrecked the movie, but it certainly didn't help. And they look at that and they really like the politics of that one, so they give it a score much higher than it probably deserves. And then they're looking at this movie, which has a political message that they don't like, and they're saying, well, the movie's bad because I don't like the political message. So, I mean, just take that with a grain of salt when you're looking at that. The critics hate it, which, I mean, if anything, makes me like the movie more. Acting in this, and I'm just going to sort of give my review of what I thought about it. The acting is pretty solid. There are a few times where I thought that the acting could probably have been better. But overall, I thought great performances by the entire cast all the way around, um, especially by Ashley Brasher, who is the main character. She plays Abby Johnson. And uh, also Robia Scott, who sometimes it's weird to praise the villain of the story, but uh, she was intimidating. She did a really, really good job with that character. And even though with an enemy, it's weird because the whole job is, the, the way you know that they did a good job portraying that character is that you didn't like them. She did a great job in that. I really didn't like her. I really got frustrated whenever she was on camera, and that's a good thing because that's how the villain is supposed to be portrayed. So Robia Scott, I thought, actually did a fantastic job. She may have done just as good a job as Ashley Brasher in this movie. Uh, the cinematography is surprisingly good. I actually do think the cinematography is really good. And the way that they would cut back and forth to uh, Abby and then to the abortion procedure and the way that they would build tension with it and especially at one point that they're showing, again, I don't want to give too much away, but they're showing parts of an abortion. It is scary and terrifying, and it really is gut-wrenching, which is the point of that scene. And so I thought the cinematography did surprisingly well for such a low-budget film, and the direction was was pretty good. A couple of weaknesses that I do want to mention. It does get a little close to having a cartoonish villain. And that's something that Pure Flick sometimes runs into a problem with, that their villains are so overtly pure evil that it almost seems like a caricature of a villain. It came close to that at times, but it was rare that it did. And when it did, they usually walked it back and made the villain seem a little bit more human. So I actually, like I said, I thought Robia Scott did a great job with the acting of that character. And even though it got a little close to it at times, it never crossed that threshold. So even though I would be a little critical of that, it's, it's a nitpick for sure. And one other weakness that I thought in the movie, the music's just not great. It's not terrible, but it's not a soundtrack that you're going to remember is the best way to say it. It didn't take me out of the movie. It didn't, well, I take that back. There was one point where the music kind of took me out of the moment. And it's a very upbeat, uplifting kind of song. I don't remember what the song was. But they do it while they're trying to get all these abortions in one day because of a hurricane. Which it seemed like for an anti-abortion movie, a really weird pick to have an uplifting, upbeat song. And treat it as an accomplishment that they got all the abortions done. thought that was a weird pick for that point in the movie. But uh, that was really my only criticism. And when you consider the entirety of the movie and how good I thought it was. Those are nitpicks at best. Overall, a fantastic film. It looks like we have a caller on line one, so let's go ahead and go to the phones. Good afternoon. What's on your mind? Hey, good afternoon. Yeah, wanted to put my two cents in on it, too, since I saw it last night. Sure. 
I think the most important things about it, first of all, the most, as far as uh, an issue that is never brought up on the pro uh, choice side Mm -hmm. is the revisitation of the event on the mother that has an abortion because, and that was one of the things, the, the long-term ramifications, uh, in other words, when you reflect on that years and years later, and it's a traumatic experience, unless they completely knock you out, that is going to come back to haunt the person. Unless they just don't have any feelings at all. Well, and one thing that they did in the film, and again, I'm I'm trying to avoid giving too much away, but there yeah. is there is a scene where they did exactly what you're talking about, and they did it before she had the big change. In other words, before right. she even thought abortion was completely wrong, she still had remorse even back when she was working at Planned Parenthood and thought she was doing the right thing. And I thought right. that was an important thing that the film did as well. And one thing it puts into perspective, too, because of the number of years, the scope of abortion, the yeah. lives that are lost uh, over a period of time. Because if even for people that are, are as adamantly pro-life as we are, mm-hmm. days and weeks and months and years go by, and it pops into our consciousness, but every day, thousands and thousands and thousands of kids are lost. Every day. Today, too. After we saw the movie last night, hundreds, maybe thousands of of babies have been lost. Well, and that's one thing that I do think the movie kind of hit the nail on the head, that when you're looking back at it, there were, I think that she said she worked there for eight years and had performed 22,000 abortions. Yeah, I wasn't going to give the number, but that's, yeah. That's that's at one tiny clinic. Yes. Yeah. So I, I do think that as far as the scope of the problem, I do think that it actually did a pretty good job of that. I, I think you're right on that. Thank you so much for your thoughts. I appreciate sure. it. All right. And I think that he's he's 100% right. And one thing that I thought it did well on too is, and I think that this may be the the best part of the whole thing. And I know that this is going to sound weird, but I promise, stick with me. I do have my reasons. Just let me reason it out here. One thing about this movie is that it doesn't show either side as completely good or completely uh, evil either. And here's what I mean on that. I promise it sounds weird. Stay with me. It does portray abortion as evil and pro-lifers as good, but it also shows that there is incorrect behavior on both sides. And what I mean by that is, you see in the film, and I just alluded to it not too long ago, that there are people that claim to be pro-life that make bad decisions because of their pro-life stance. It's not enough to be right. You also have to be right in the right way. So just because you happen to be right on an issue doesn't mean that any anything that you do, any action that you take, as a result of being right, is justified. And one thing that they did show was they showed a person that shot an abortion doctor and killed him, which doesn't make any sense because if you're pro-protecting life, it doesn't make sense to take somebody's life, even if they are somebody that has done incredibly horrible, wicked things, in cold blood when he's unarmed like that. And another thing that it showed was people that claimed to be pro-life, that were shouting people down, calling young women whores, and you know, saying all kinds of evil, terrible things about them in front of the Planned Parenthood facility there. And there are other groups of people, other Christians there, that are pro-life, that don't do that, that take a different approach, that is far more effective. And so it shows that the pro-life side is not completely without blame and also shows that your approach does matter. Now, one thing that I want to bring up here is I think that the biblical principle of teaching the truth in love applies. Because the people that were yelling and insulting and trying to scare the young women that were going into the clinic, all that did was drive them into the building faster. And what they were saying may or may not have been true, 
But truth without love is just brutality. We're called to be tr truth tellers. We don't lie to people. We don't sugarcoat things. But we also don't have to beat them over the head with the truth either. And I think that that's a biblical example, and it's an example that was sort of modeled in this film. And I also think equally important is it showed a different side of the people in Planned Parenthood, because, of course, the main character is somebody that works for Planned Parenthood, so you expect that at least a little bit going into it. But it also portrayed a lot of her co-workers that are there at Planned Parenthood as people that have good intentions. And that's important because even the pro-lifers that were handling it the wrong way, they had good intentions, but they had the wrong approach. And then on the other side of it, there were people, women that worked for Planned Parenthood, that had good intentions, they just didn't have truth. So one side liked truth, the other side liked love. And in Planned Parenthood's case, they basically said, well, this is a bad situation and we make the bad situation go away, therefore we're doing a favor for these women and we're actually helping them. And it takes the character a long time to get to the point where she realizes that she's lying to them, that she's telling them to do something that is not good and not right and not helpful. And so because of that, and because it does show that other side, there are a couple of characters that know what they're doing and they understand what's actually going on, and they there's really no redemption for them. And I'm not saying that their sins couldn't be forgiven. I'm saying that, you know, there's no redeeming qualities for them in this portrayal of this particular movie. But there's a lot of characters in there that were on the pro-choice, pro-abortion side of it that it's portraying they actually think they're doing the right thing. And I think that's important to remember because if we remember that they think they're in the right, it is going to cause us to show a little bit more compassion and maybe change our approach. Because if we continue to think of everybody as monsters, it's going to be very, far, it's going to be very difficult for us to reach out to somebody. And we have to also remember that we've been engaged in sin and we have done things that we thought was the right thing to do at the time, only to look back and realize that we were completely wrong. Anybody that hasn't done that is either not thinking or thinks far too much of themselves and doesn't realize their own shortcomings. So that's part of the reasons that I thought that it was, it was a really important film from that direction. And I'll say this about it as well just sort of as a passing thought. A lot of conservatives are saying that it didn't deserve the R rating. And while I understand where they're coming from, and I do agree with their analysis that a movie that wasn't anti-abortion, that agreed with the politics of the people rating the movies, honestly, the same stuff being showed in that movie probably doesn't get an R rating. That's probably safe to say. However, Personally, just coming at it from my perspective, what taking the, trying to take the politics out of it as much as possible, if I were watching this movie and you ask me how I would rate it, I would probably give it an R rating too. Because if we're saying that it doesn't deserve an R rating, what we as conservatives are sort of saying is, well, an abortion isn't something that is a traumatic, horrible thing to witness, even though it is. And that's one thing that we've got to remember is that if we are saying, well, it doesn't deserve an R rating, aren't we somewhat implying that witnessing an abortion take place isn't something that is deeply troubling and disturbing to people? Now, do I think that my fellow conservative brethren are correct in saying that it probably got its R rating because of politics and because people didn't want teenagers to see this movie? Yeah, I think that's probably a fair assessment. But whether or not the reason behind the rating is correct or incorrect doesn't mean that the rating itself is incorrect. That being said, if you are a parent, especially if you have teenagers, I think that this is a very important movie for them to see. And there are parts where it is graphic, and there are parts where it is very, very hard to watch. But it is worth it. Because its graphicness... And the, I don't even want to say gore, but the, the, the more disturbing scenes 
are what forces you to sort of look this issue in the face and remember that's some that's an image that's going to stick with you that's an image that you're going to be able to remember when you're thinking about what is actually happening and what is actually going on when people talk about different kinds of abortions that kind of thing so arming yourself with knowledge i think is is something that is important even if it is disturbing and uncomfortable and the movie tells you right out i think in the very first scene that it says the, the story is going to make you squirm a little bit and Certainly, they were not right. There were scenes where I have a very strong constitution, a very strong stomach. I'm a news guy. I've seen ISIS behead people. I mean, I've seen some of the most grotesque things you'll ever see, and it made me very uncomfortable. So I get that the movie's going to be a little bit hard to watch at times, but I do think that the overall message is worth it, and it is a movie that, in my opinion, every single person should see. So that being said, I'm going to be doing this all week because I do want this movie to be a success. I do want it to do very well. And because of that, I've decided as long as this thing is in theaters, it, especially for the first week, I'm going to be running their ads completely free of charge. They're not paying me for this. I'm doing this because I think it, this movie is this important. So while we take a break, enjoy this trailer from Unplanned. Abby Johnson is in the other room. Here. Our first order of business is to present Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award. Abby Johnson. This is Abby. She's our newest volunteer escort. Abby, this is Cheryl Alessandro. I'd be the youngest director in Planned Parenthood history. You'll actually be in charge of the abortions at your clinic. I have a chance to make a real difference. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, you're still going to be a baby killer. The only thing that's changed is you, Abby. Can you even hear yourself talk right now about these procedures? These are little babies. I'm not going to apologize for doing a job that helps women in crisis. There's still a part of me that isn't sure. I know. But the one thing that all experts agree on is that at this stage, the fetus can't feel anything. Sorry to bother you, but they need an extra person in the back room. Are you free? I saw it, and it was like it was twisting and fighting for its life. We commend the souls of these hundreds of children. And Lord, we pray to end abortion. I really appreciate what you've done for us. I'll not forget it. 22,000 abortions. How do I even comprehend that? Rough day at the office. You can say that. You're making a mess. Boo! What are you doing? It's your dad and me. You are our baby from the moment of conception. We are paying you to be a perfect instrument of corporate policy. We are an abortion provider. I can't be part of this anymore. Everything that they told us is a lie. Don't underestimate the repercussions of this. You gotta be careful. Rhonda, please don't do this! Rhonda! Let me tell you what's gonna happen if you walk through that door. Congratulations. You have made an enemy of one of the most powerful organizations on the planet. Okay, and welcome back. It is time now for the Daily Dose of Stupid. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. And today's Daily Dose of Stupid comes from Alyssa Milano. So Alyssa Milano tweeted this earlier, and since we are on this topic, this was what she tweeted earlier today in defense of abortion. So she, st she says here, I love God, I believe in God, but I don't believe my personal beliefs of which we can't confirm should override scientific facts and what we can confirm. And then she quotes John 3.12 saying, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? All right, so as it doesn't take an expert to figure out, there's quite a bit of stupid contained within this one tweet. But in one fell swoop, 
in just one tweet, she she basically proves how she is woefully ignorant of both scripture and science, which is a very hard thing to do. But you can, here's the thing. This is basically derived from a belief that people on the pro-abortion side have always had that the only reason anybody would ever believe that abortion is wrong or that the person inside the womb is a person is because you're some religious zealot that just doesn't know any better and you're clinging on to your silly beliefs about God. And because of that, you're saying that it's incorrect. Because if you just knew the science, if you just knew that the science, which trumps the religion, if you just knew what it was, then you would see how silly it is and you would throw away that belief and you would quickly see that it's not a person. Except the thing is, you can actually get to the personhood inside the womb without science. In fact, a lot of people do. You have people, for example, like Austin Peterson, who is an atheist, doesn't believe in any kind of God but still believes that the person inside the womb is indeed a human being. And he's not the only one. Granted that, you know, the common belief of atheist is not that. But there are atheists that believe this. And there's quite a few scientific ways to get there. Um, I've made these arguments time and time again, so I'm not going to rehash all of them. I've got tons of videos on this if you want to go, go back and look at my arguments for them. But the thing is, there's lots of scientific evidence that you don't even have to go to a place using any religion to prove this. The only thing that you have to go to religion for is the inherent value of human life, because that's not something that you can quantify through a scientific means. And it's true that if you do value human life and the natural place that that logic is going is that you have to value everybody that is a human intrinsically and value them equally, that you are going to value people that are adults just as much as you will an unborn child. But my point is, if you take that underpinning out of it, sure, you get rid of the need to protect the unborn, but you also get rid of the need to protect anybody. You essentially assert that everybody is a clump of cells. Everybody is a meaningless animal that, you know, whatever we do, good, bad, doesn't really matter. You basically arrive at nihilism or nihilism, however you say that, I don't do well with German, but you essentially arrive at that place where nothing matters. And so it's true that that underpinning of religion does get you to the point of every, uh, human life is intrinsically valuable, but you can't disconnect that from the value of human life in the stance that every human's life ought to be valued equally. And so if you are a person, regardless of faith, regardless of your rationale behind this, that believes that every human should be equally valued, then if you go to the science for it and use a scientific method to determine what is a human, you will always arrive, if you're honest about it, at the conclusion that a person in the womb is exactly the same value-wise and is just as human as a person outside the womb. And I've issued this challenge, I don't know to uh, how many people that are pro-abortion activists that can you give me a scientific definition of humanity that excludes the unborn without specifically saying, except for people in the womb? You can't do it because from a biology standpoint, you can't differentiate the person in the womb from somebody outside the womb without also alienating somebody else that is outside the womb. And so that's an exercise I've done. I've never heard a good answer for it. And I've never asked anybody to, to justify it through religion or anything like that. Even if I stopped believing in God, I would still have to believe that life in the womb as equally deserving of protection that any life outside the womb is. Now, I might become an, a nihilist, but if I do, then that means I just don't think any lives matter. And so that's the thing. You can't disconnect those two ideas. But... This is something that pro-abortion activists constantly pretend cannot be done, and Alyssa Milano is in that same camp. But here's the thing that I don't really understand. Usually when somebody misquotes scripture or uses it incorrectly, you know, they, they pull it out of context or there's something that they forgot to mention. That happens from time to time. 
But in this particular situation, I can't even figure out where she thought she was going with this one. Reading her tweet and then reading the actual verse that she uses, maybe I'm just missing it, but I don't even see how that pertains to her argument. And so I can't defeat it because I don't understand the point that it's even making. I mean, I know the verse well. I know that it's while Christ is talking to Nicodemus about this differentiation between uh, physical birth and, and baptism and the parallels there. I, I get that. I understand that. I understand that he's trying to explain a uh, new spiritual rebirth to Nicodemus. But the verse that she's talking about, I don't get that one at all. I don't understand how that plays into this debate even a little bit. So uh, this is something that admittedly I can't counter because I don't understand what it's trying to say in the first place. But nonetheless, there is a cornucopia of scriptures that tell us that we're not supposed to, that, that people in the womb are certainly people that God cherishes and, and people just as much as any adult is. And we can go through out several different scriptures and talk about that. I've done that, you know, no telling how many times again, you can look through any of my old videos and, and find this out. But I want to speak for a moment to a larger problem, a larger issue that she's talking about that is addressed here. And unfortunately, this is something that has been spread throughout a lot of the broader Christian community using the Christian word in the sense of people that just claim Christianity, whether or not they actually live it or not. This is unfortunately a prevailing idea that's very convenient. And that's the reason that people have bought into it, which is that faith is blind faith, whereas science is an undisputable fact. Unfortunately, a growing number of people that claim Christianity, presumably like Alyssa Milano, really do believe this. They think that what makes faith faith is that, well, we can't confirm it, we can't prove it, we really don't know. We're not really convicted of faith, and we're not really sure whether it's true or not, and that's what faith is. But nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, if you look at first, if you look at First Peter three fifteen, it instructs us to always be ready to make a defense to everyone that asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. In other words, if you're talking about your faith and you can't explain it to somebody else, you can't explain why you believe what you believe, you can't explain why you're a Christian to another person, then you are actually working in defiance of God's word. You are not somebody that is living the life that God instructs us to live if you can't sit down with somebody and explain to them why you live the way that you do, why you are a Christian, why you believe these things. If you can't give a defense for that, then that is something that you need to rectify and make it to where you can give a defense. So this idea of blind faith, oh, well, I can't explain it. I don't know why I believe what I do. I just do, and it's my personal belief, and that's all there is to it. Well, no wonder you think that science is stronger than that because your faith isn't based on anything at that point. We could also look at Luke 1.4, where Luke is explaining the reason that he wrote his gospel was, quote, so that you may know the exact truth about things that you have been taught. And this was the reason that other apostles and other writers in the Bible wrote down their story or their book of the Bible, whatever it may have been. They were doing it for instruction because they believed that these matters were important and you needed to learn and to know why you believe what you believe. And that's exactly what Luke is saying here. He's saying the things that you've been taught need to be reinforced and so that you can be sure of those things. In other words, not, well, it's my personal belief and so I believe it and that's just the way it is. A, that circular logic. And B, it's not something that's prescribed in the scripture. The apostles went to great lengths to make sure that the people that were in the church knew why they believed what they believed and could explain it to other people. And whenever they thought there might be an area where they might be a little fuzzy on, they went to reinforce it so that they could be sure. Not something that, as Alyssa Milano put, they can't confirm. No, no, no. They could confirm it. And the gospel accounts are specifically there for that. Also, this line of thinking has fallen into a dangerous trap of putting wisdom of men above God's wisdom. And this is something that is warned about in Old and New Testament over and over again. Proverbs 14, 12, for example, says, 
There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. This is the way Satan gets a lot of people. All he does is put them on a path that seems right. And so because there's this sort of general feeling of it being right, they just continue down it. And by the way, I'm not looking down my nose at people. I've been in this situation before. There have been things that I thought I was doing the right thing, and I realized years later, boy, I screwed that one up. I think anybody that's honest with themselves knows this. That there are things that are detrimental to us that we've been doing for a very long time because we thought it was the right thing to do. But what is being assumed here is that the wisdom of ourselves or the wisdom of those around us are better than God's wisdom. See, because one of the big messages of, of Proverbs and of Solomon's life in general, who wrote this passage, of course, is that human wisdom is finite, and that's the reason that we need to rely on God's wisdom and treat it as more important and something to be revered at a higher level than the wisdom of man. Isaiah alludes to this in Isaiah 5, verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, the Christian is called to assume that when there is a conflict between the knowledge of the world and the knowledge of God, that he gives the default to God. Now, that doesn't mean you never question anything. It doesn't mean that you don't seriously look into the things that God has told us to prove that these things are true. That also is a quality that is given a great deal of reverence in the Scripture. In fact, it specifically talks about in the book of Acts, the Bereans being more excellent because they were searching the Scriptures to see if the things that they had been taught were true. And we just looked at the Gospel of Luke saying that that's the same reason that we're given his gospel. So this isn't something where you just say, oh, well, God said it, it must be true, that's the end of it, you can't convince me otherwise. But what it is saying is, when you look at conflicting accounts, and you have a long, drawn-out experience of God being right on things and man being wrong, and you see the world saying one thing and God saying another thing, you're supposed to assume that God's right and men are wrong. And so that's another thing that I think that this is a dangerous line of thinking because of that, because it puts the world's wisdom on a higher plane than God's wisdom and saying, well, the world's wisdom, which is essentially what Milano is saying here, the world's wisdom ought to trump God's wisdom because we can confirm that and we can't confirm God, even though we can using the basic human logic and reason that he gave us and searching his word. But another thing here, it's often talked about by especially people on the left that theology and science are enemies. But science, when done correctly, is the study of God's creation. And sure, it can bring up questions, and, and we should question things. I've always been an advocate of that. But we're not supposed to treat them as though they're adversaries. Theology and science are not enemies. They complement one another. In fact, if you look through the parables of Christ, it was very often that he would use things from biology and cultural norms that he would use to explain spiritual truths. The book of Romans tells us that creation is a testament to God and his wisdom, and that when we see things in creation, it ought to remind us of God's infinite wisdom and his power. And so in, in turn, essentially what happens is that our better understanding of nature can in certain ways help us better understand God. This was a belief of a lot of scientists, like Sir Isaac Newton. And so we constantly treat, and some Christians unfortunately fall into this trap as well, that they actually treat science as though it's something to be, I don't know, maligned or put down. Not most of the ones that I know, but I know that there are Christians out there that do that. But theology and science complement each other, and they complement each other perfectly. But before we do go, I had to mention this as well, because this is yet another cornucopia of stupid. Alyssa Milano is also tweeting about Joe Biden. And in this tweet, she says, <clears throat> I am proud to call Joe Biden my friend. 
He has been the leader and a champion on fighting violence against women for many years, and I have been fortunate to accompany him to events with survivors where he has listened to their stories, empathized with them, and comforted them. All right, so here's the thing. Joe Biden, for those of you who are unaware, has been accused of now two different women of basically walking up behind them, putting his hands either on their arms or on their shoulders, kissing the back of their head, sort of getting very close and, and being, and it made them very uncomfortable. And so here's what Alyssa Milano is saying. She's saying that in this tweet, essentially, well, yeah, Joe may or may not have done that, but he's my buddy and he's my friend. And so really he just kind of gets a pass. And she sort of reinforces this with a second tweet that she puts out. And this is actually a response to the original tweet. I believe that Joe Biden's intent has never been to make anyone uncomfortable and that his kind, empathetic leadership is what our country needs, especially now. So I guess Alyssa Milano's reasoning here is, well, Joe Biden's my friend and I've known him for a really long time. Plus, from a political standpoint, we really kind of need him right now. So let's just brush all those accusations under the rug. Let's just not pay attention to those. And she didn't come right out and say it that way, but in so many words, she kind of did. And the reason this is so incredibly problematic is because giving him a pass is not the stance that Alyssa Milano took on previous cases. For example, Brett Kavanaugh. Remember that she was one of the people beating the drum and talking about how Brett Kavanaugh needed to be not even considered for the Supreme Court just because of the mere accusation. Joe Biden's accusation happened five years ago. And by the way, there's not photographic proof of this particular, these particular two women that are raising these complaints, but there is photographic proof of Joe Biden doing basically exactly the same thing to other women and making them uncomfortable. And he's just kind of a weird, creepy guy, and, and we've known this for years. This is not something that is news, really. I think it became news because these women came forward in such strong fashion against it and talking about how uncomfortable it made them. But the idea that Joe Biden doing this is a new phenomenon, no, it's really not. We, we know better. We know that this has been something that has been going on for a really long time. This has been joked about since he was Senator Biden. And so that's one thing that is problematic, but considering that Alyssa Milano literally dressed up in the handma Handmaid's Tale garb and was making a fool out of herself doing all kinds of different protests at the Kavanaugh hearing based on a 30-year-old charge from a woman that can't even prove that she knew Brett Kavanaugh, much less that he tried to rape her, and saying that just kind of ignoring the accusations against Joe Biden because he's your buddy and you think that it's politically expedient to do so. That's not a really good excuse for a moral standard. It's just not. And this double standard is blatantly obvious to anybody that's willing to look. But this is not the only tweet that she issued out. There was also one where she said, I respect Lucy Flores, by the way, she's one of the accusers, decision to share her story and agree with Biden that we all must pay attention to it. But just as we must believe women and decide, that decide to come forward, we cannot assume that all exper women's experiences are the same. Again, the problem with this is not that the logic itself is technically flawed. It's more that it's a complete double standard because the truth is there are a lot of women that have had Joe Biden do this to him, including, by the way, Laura Ingram, and said it didn't make her uncomfortable. She was fine with it. And I think that there is some fairness in saying that even though I think it's weird and creepy and, and part of that may be because I'm not a touchy-feely guy and Joe Biden very much is, a lot of men, especially older men, that's one way that they show their affection, not trying to make excuses for it. And frankly, I think that you're far better off being somebody more like Mike Pence that's very buttoned up and keeps his distance from women. By the way, that's a policy that I do. I honestly... Even when women that are fans of the show come up to me or women at church come up to me, they hug me and I do it because I don't want to be rude. But usually I'm, I'm just not a touchy feely person and I'd rather keep my distance. So I realize that I have a little bit of bias here because I'm just so far the opposite of Joe Biden on this. And I do think that it's a little creepy and I think that it would be in his best interest 
to stop it. And that there will be some women that when he does that, he's going to make uncomfortable. But I don't think that this, you know, is absolutely insane. And I think that it does make, it makes sense that we take into account that there are a lot of women that are saying that their experiences with Joe Biden have been completely benign, even when he did essentially the same thing to them as he did to these other women. I don't think that's a completely unfair uh, way to reason this story out. However, what is unfair is that she's saying this and she's saying, well, we do need to kind of believe the women, but what we need to not do is we need to not really throw stones at Joe Biden because some women's experiences are different and some women were not made uncomfortable by it. Well, that's not what she was saying when Brett Kavanaugh's case was going on. In fact, when there were women that were coming out and saying, we've never had a problem with Brett Kavanaugh. He's always been very polite. He's always been very buttoned up. He's never made any kind of advances toward us whatsoever. It was Alyssa Milano and others that were saying, no, 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 that doesn't, that doesn't change anything. So what that he's nice to some women? If he was raping other women, then that's a problem. Well, yeah, but you can't prove the allegations. And that's the thing. They were treating that as though that was not a proper consideration when it came to Kavanaugh, but it's totally appropriate to do that to Joe Biden. And that really is the difference, is that her political preferences are very clearly skewing her judgment in this area. But all I would have to say is pick a standard and stick with it. That's all I'm asking. Even if I disagree with your standard, I may criticize the standard, but at least if you pick one standard and stick with it, I know that you're at least being consistent. And I, that's, that's good advice for anybody, not just Alyssa Milano. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. One thing that we have talked a lot about today is the movie Unplanned. And I think that that makes sense because it is such an important movie and I, I hope that it's a movie that makes a real difference in this country. I don't know that it will. I don't know if a lot of people that were sort of on the fence about abortion or maybe even for abortion will go see it and it will change their mind. But whether it does or not, it's an important movie for people to see because it does portray a lot of real human truths. And one thing that I talked about is that it really portrayed, and I do think this may be the most important thing that this movie does, it really portrayed the main character who was somebody who was a director at an abortion clinic in Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year, as somebody that thought she was doing the right thing. And when I thought about that, and when I saw that movie, I thought about Paul. The Apostle Paul was somebody who believed he was doing the right thing and got a rude awakening on the road to Damascus to realize that he had not, and, and I do think that there were some parallels with this film, and I did want to bring that up. So let's go ahead and go to Philippians 3, verses 5 through 6. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which the law, which is in the law, found blameless. Now, one thing that Paul is doing here is he's talking to a group of people that were putting a lot of emphasis on their lineage. They were very proud of the fact that they were Jews. And so he's trying to explain to them, look, I wasn't just a Jew. I was the Jewiest of all the Jews, if that's appropriate to say. Uh, you're talking about somebody that had a reason to be proud of his Judaism. It was me. I wasn't just a Jew. I knew that I was of the tribe of Benjamin, and I was a Pharisee, which is the most zealous of all the sects, and I was somebody that actually went out and persecuted the church because I thought it was the right thing to do. And when you look down at that, when you look at this particular verse, 
he talks about being a persecutor of the church because of how zealous he was, because he thought he was doing God's work. And he also talks about how he had been found blameless. So what Paul is essentially saying and, and explaining to the church here at Philippi, he's like, look, I wasn't just outside the church. I wasn't just lost and kind of benign and wandering around aimlessly. I was public enemy number one. It was my point to eradicate everybody that worshiped Jesus. That's how serious he was about it. And it's kind of similar to Abby Johnson's story. Somebody that went out and not only was a supporter of Planned Parenthood sort of in a benign way, she went out and recruited people, she sold abortions, she made the case to people that what they were doing was the right thing to do. That was her job, and she did it for eight years. And so this is somebody that did a complete 180 about as dramatic as a turnaround can be. And I want you to remember that in Acts, there were brethren that were scared of Paul. I mean, terrified. In fact, the brother that was specifically asked to go out and teach Paul and to go baptize him, when the Lord spoke to him, he basically told the Lord, I mean, he didn't say no outright, but he was kind of like, are you sure about this, God? I've heard about this guy, and, and this is not somebody that we want on our side. And there is an indication based on some of the history we can piece together from the Bible, even though we don't know a ton about the three years after uh, Paul was baptized. We do know that there are accounts of people that were afraid of Paul and didn't really trust him because they thought maybe it was a trick or some kind of trap or he was trying to infiltrate them or something. But they were afraid of Paul because of how zealous he was to take out Christians to kill them unless they renounced Christianity. That's how serious Paul was about this. And I think looking back on that and looking at Abby Johnson's story, the message is actually pretty similar. Because if you're looking at the, the last part of verse 6 here, he says, As to zeal a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. What is Paul saying there? He's saying, I murdered Christians. It was my mission in life, and I did it with a clear conscience. I did it believing I was actually doing God's work in doing this. And to have that kind of turnaround and that kind of repentance is kind of similar to Abby Johnson's story. But it's not completely dissimilar to our story either. Maybe not in a very visual way or in a way that people would understand the parallel that quickly. But weren't we all enemies of Christ? Enemies of God before we came to Christ? Enemies of the church before we were redeemed of our sins and washed in his blood? Isn't that what we were? Maybe we were more or less active on it, but when you sum it all up, yeah, that's exactly what we were. And so I think that it's really important for us to remember that when we're talking to somebody, even somebody that has a lot of sin in their past, that we really were in the same boat. And I think that it also acts as a, a very visual cautionary tale. Because to us, sometimes things seem right, and because of our finite human knowledge and human imperfection, it seems right to us. And because of that, we go ahead and do it even though it happens to be the wrong thing. And usually that happens when somebody lies to themselves. Abby Johnson lied to herself for years that she was helping these women. These women came to her for help. And instead of really helping them, she told them that killing their own children was the right thing to do. And Paul thought that he was doing God's will, that he was actually acting on God's behalf by murdering people that worshipped his son. And when you think of the gravity of that, 
it really does make you wonder how they even dealt with how they dealt with that burden. But the thing is, regardless of what you have going on in your life, I want you to remember this. God's strongest soldiers get the heaviest swords. And what that means is, they've got a lot to carry around. But he gives it to them because he knows they'll be able to carry it. He knows they'll be able to wield it. And with a heavy sword, you can do a lot more good for his, for his kingdom. You're a much better soldier for him. Because Paul used his experience as somebody who used to persecute the church to let people know that if I can be a Christian, anybody can. And I think in a similar way, Abby Johnson's story can show us, if I can become pro-life, anybody can. There is forgiveness and there is redemption. There is no sin. There is no life that is so stained, that is so marred, that God can't take it and turn it into something good for him. So you may have to carry a really heavy sword, but it's one that you can use to do a lot of good for God's kingdom. And that's true of any of us. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.